it, it's good? Okay. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Tolof. I'm part of the SA team. Uh, with me today we have uh, Sobol, who's also a DSA member. And we're here to talk a little bit about what DSA does. And obviously, if you have questions and anything, then we'll be happy to try to try yeah, We'll try to keep that as some sort of as some sort of round table because we want a discussion with you. This is not too going to be a talk. Um, so whenever you have questions, just ask and we will try to answer. The <laughs> okay, uh, the DSA team consists uh, currently of eight people, seven people, I think, seven, yeah. yeah seven. Uh, we're, we, most of us are in Europe, but we also have uh, Luca, who's in Canada. Uh, apart from that, Paroid is on uh, holiday in the group with me. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, various other people. Yeah, the duties we have as Debian system administrator is basically to build and maintain the infrastructure you are all using for uh, running our distribution. Um, it's the general sysadmin, uh, sysadmin stuff. We are doing uh, uh, installing security updates, uh, keeping machines up to date, um, keeping the hardware running, um, creating accounts for you, um, running DNS, mail, um, yeah. So one thing we actually don't do is we generally just provide the base. We provide the, the, the OS and support for that. We don't run most of the services. So like list that in org, we don't, we're not the people you want to talk to if there is some problem with Spam handling. With spam handling. <laughs> uh, then you want to talk to this guy, who's also <laughs> part of the, the, the list master team. Um, similar bugs that in all the if web pages. We don't, we make sure that the Apache is running, but if, if you find typos a, on the web yeah, page, if there's a typo, them. don't blame us. <laughs> yeah, um, we have, um, I don't know how many machines we run in the meantime. I think it's something around 150, 160 it, machines in total including the VMs? No, if you count VMs, there are, it's more like 250. Okay, um, but we run those machines uh, currently at about 30 locations worldwide. Um, also part of that our duty is to deal with the uh, hosters and the local admins. Um, so if, we, if they have firewalls running in front of our machines, we try to convince them to shut down the uh, to disable the firewall parts for uh, our machines, so we get we c uh, we can manage those stuff ourselves. Yeah, this is this is often interesting. We have some locations where the machines are knackered, for instance, and this breaks a uh, secure NTP. So there are there are various places where uh, we have to make accommodations because it's hard to get the hardware to be another place. Maybe it's it's dev boards for an architecture which is being bootstrapped. There are, so in, in some cases, we kind of have to endure a little bit of pain for that. Uh, but most hosters and mo most local admins are really nice people, really easy to deal with, and very, very accommodating. <laughs> and I mean, we don't pay for any of this. So it's all sponsored and given to us free of charge. So we're yeah, and quite lucky. It differs from location to location. We currently have. M Locations where we have a full rack of hardware, which we can, or a full rack which we can populate with hardware, and there are other locations where we just have one or two machines sitting and uh, doing the jobs for for us. Um, keep in mind, all of us uh, uh, seven persons account uh, are not paid to do uh, sysadmin jobs, so we are all doing that on our volunteer time. So if you speak up on IRC. Sometimes you will not get any reaction within five minutes, but I think that's mostly clear to all of you. Yeah, uh, since we have so many machines, we like automation. We run Puppet everywhere. 
it, it, it was chosen some time ago, and it generally does the right thing and generally works okay. Uh, this often makes for some interesting problems when bootstrapping, because apparently Ruby is really, really awesome to bootstrap, right, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Especially on ARM. Um, we also like Git. We have uh, the entire Puppet repositories in Git. Uh, our domains are in Git. Uh, well, our wiki is in Git. Everything. And, yeah, basically, if it, everything can be put into Git. You probably don't want to do it to a database, but like anything else, put it in it. We have some sort of account management tool, which we are um, currently rewriting. It's called UserDLDAP or UDLDAP. Uh, Luca has done quite a lot of work on the rewrite, uh, which I think it's already handling the generating stuff, which is rolled out to the Debian.org machines. All the other uh, Parts of UDLDAP are still using the old code base, which is, um, well, ugly to read. It reads like Paul Bash in, uh, written in Python. So if you have spare time and knowledge in Python, help us to finish the rewrite job. Yeah, so the, the new UD is written in its a Django project, so it's fairly nice and well written. Uh, so what LDAP actually does is it has a local LDAP server which runs on the machine called Draghi, which is DB Debian org. And from on there, it generates static files which are synced out to all machines. So even though we're using LDAP for account information, we don't have a single point of failure. So if that machine goes down, then it means you can't update your password but you can, or, or your SH keys, but you can still log in various places. And it also works around network issues between machines. So if SSH b between Draghi and the porting machine or whatever works, um, you, get the, uh, you can log into machines. We um, monitor our machines uh, using Munin and, uh, well, nowadays, Ikinger. Ikinger, yeah. yeah. Um, have um, we had some uh, performance issues with Munin, but uh, with the uh, Wizzy version, I think it was, and the async were, um, stuff, Munin works quite well for us. Um, in general, if there are web pages like uh, Ikingar or Munin asking for a password, then um, this is just DSA dash guest and either no password or uh, and or, or uh, just a random password. This is just to protect uh, our hardware, no, well, our uh, services, so that script kiddies or whoever wants to to see what his script is uh, doing in effect to the Debian services, um, not seeing the r results directly. But everyone who knows how the Debian system economy uh, system yeah, works, um, you get access to the. It's, it's also so we can accidentally end up with uh, spiders walking around because uh, Moonin's web interface is uh, it's generating the, the graphs on the fly and it's using our D tool and that can consume great amounts of CPU power <laughs> and web spiders are really really good at, at, at wasting, uh, wasting CPU power for us so we kind of want to keep them off those pages. To track our issues we currently have with um, uh, hardware failures, with um, accounts we need to create, and so on, we use Request Tracker on rt.debian.org, which some other teams use as well. Um, um, you can either mail it or use a web interface. Debian developers, I think, only for the for viewing the web, web interface. Uh, uh, yeah. So most people will only. For most people, it's read-only. Uh, well, you can you can interface with request through email, of course. Uh, if you need to send something there, send it to rt at rt.debian.org and make sure to include Debian RT in the subject because else we'll just throw it away because then it's spam. It's really efficient spam filter. Uh, it's slightly annoying for uh, when you submit the first ticket. Yeah. 
yeah, the last talk we gave about the DSA team was, I think, two years ago. So we tried to summarize what we've done in the last two years. Um, we have since, when, when was that meeting in Oslo, I think, three years ago? Three years ago, yeah. Three years ago, we decided that we want at least the infrastructure hardware, not the porting hardware, on machines that, is, uh, that are under warranty, so we can um, open a ticket at HP, IBM, or whatever, and ask them to send replacement parts when hardware breaks. Um, we use server-grade hardware. Currently, most of the machines are HP machines, um, DL380, DL360, DL580. Yeah. yeah, they work quite well. Uh, and I think we're mostly done with that transition. Uh, and it turns out that having actual servers rather than something somebody threw together and put under a desk and then forgot about is actually makes for less pain and yeah. more uptime. Um, we try to consolidate the amount of data centers we are having core services running in. So currently we have like three data center, three to five data centers where we have quite a lot of services running in. So it's Manda, Bytemark, um, GRNet still a little bit. Yeah. Um, OCOSL. O OCOSL, UBC. Mm, UBC EC. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we also have some other places with fewer machines, but since it's often painful to have a single machine in, in a location. We try to avoid that. So it's it's kind of a trade-off. You want to you want to have enough locations that you have resilience, but you don't want to have so many that you basically have two machines everywhere. And each time there is a problem, you you have to deal with somebody who you haven't spoken to in two years because that was when the last problem occurred. Yeah, mm, on the. Mm. Co uh, on the core or for the core services, we are currently using Ganetti for virtualization, which is uh, some sort of KVM-based uh, uh, virtualization framework. It's um, a cluster manager which yeah. came out of Google yeah. and which works really well. Its target is clusters from one to fifty machines and it free software, of yeah, course. It works it's very platform. well for us. Um, uh, in Target, where I recently, or where I try to work on in the, in the last few months, is the uh, single sign-on framework for web applications. Um, thankfully, together with Enrico, who uh, helped quite a lot with that, um, we written the Paul, ugly Perl code I wrote uh, to to Python Django framework. So. Um, we hope to be able to um, well provide single sign-on also for non-Debian.org um, web services, which um, with the current software we use for uh, Debian.org didn't work out for security reasons so well. So let's see how well, where we stand in two years with single sign-on on web stuff. Yeah, so currently uh, we we had a problem earlier this year where the, the backup server we had would die and then die and then die. And with various problems with, it claimed to have hard drive errors, but it looked more like controller errors and so on. Uh, obviously running without backups isn't a terribly good idea. So we bootstrapped another backup server, but it, it was running at the, in the Bytemark uh, data center. And because we have many other services hosted there, that's not a very good situation, just because if something happens and at that data mark. center at that data center and it burns down, then we've suddenly lost both the backups and the services being backed up. So, two uh, a month ago, so yeah. we got a new machine. Uh, it's hosted at DGI in, DGI in Düsseldorf, and it's happily checking along and making backups. Uh, we're currently using Backler for, for backups, and it's working okay. Uh, we're having some interesting problems with uh, scheduling of backups, so we're probably going to need to do some fixes there. Yeah, Luca is doing the UDL rewrite. As men already mentioned earlier, we can need helping hands there. Um, 
I think Paul and Peter uh, worked on or are working on the on the snapshot uh, infrastructure, um, giving um, uh, especially the QA integration for for snapshot. Yeah, we had a donation from uh, LeaseWeb earlier this year. Um, so uh, similar to the backup service, it, it turns out that file systems when or, or serv service when they grow big enough, you end up with lots of disks dying. And Linux isn't terribly good at handling this when you get enough of enough of your disks dying. So um, we had one machine which died with controller failure again, and we kind of tried to revive it. it wasn't really successful. Uh, so we ended up uh, getting this donation from LeaseWeb. And we then have a small cluster of machines in their data center where and we. Snapshot is currently, I think, 23 terabytes? Yeah, something 20, like that. 10, 30 giga, uh, terabytes, something like that in size, which is currently the biggest archive we currently maintain. Um, yeah, we try to roll out um, SSL everywhere in the in the past. Yeah, we're moving uh, basically in. It's it's been something we wanted to do for a while to enable HTTPS and so on everywhere, even on kind of public and open resources. Uh, it felt with the. It wasn't really triggered by, but it was kind of. It, in, in the same way in, as the Snowden things, then it was like, yeah, we should probably actually move forward on, on it because the, it turns out that there are entirely too many people who like uh, TCP dumping too too much. So, um, <laughs> pushing for more SL everywhere. Um, we there was some a little bit of controversy around this when we did it to people in org because it turns out that. Uh, WGET in DI, I, I think, had some problems with uh, verifying the certificates and so on. So it's not a completely uncontroversial and smooth move, but we still like. Sometimes you need to make a little bit of sacrifice to to actually get the security we want. Hmm? CDN. Uh, yeah, and related to that, also we push some bits towards using CDNs, uh, which also are interesting in the in the context of SSL, because you have to give your search to somebody else, and there is a trade-off there. So you kind of have to trust your provider there. What we are also currently doing, we due to the fact that we got a very huge donation from uh, ByteMark, I think one and a half years ago, mm. they. Uh, uh, they gave us a full blade center and uh, I think six MSA shelves. Yeah. Six? Three or four. Well, three chassis plus, plus three, three extension yes. chassis, yeah. I think. And um, so we ha currently still have some spare CPU cycles left at, at ByteMark, and I'm currently uh, setting up OpenStack at the ByteMark data center f for one or two blades. So. In the end, the idea is that Debian developers can um, start VMs there themselves, similar to the VMs we are using for our infrastructure. So we can more easily migrate Debian.NET services to Debian.org services, um, making, giving you some sort of um, common uh, infrastructure we use uh, on, on Debian so you can um, well, help us to migrate services, or, or we can help you to migrate services from your hardware to the Debian infrastructure hardware. Uh, and part of the reason for that is it turns out that running various half official services on people's home machines and co load machines and so on isn't a t terribly good idea because people will, in m often they'll run for years and then somebody will get bored or they'll quit Debian or they'll go Whatever. broke or like the machine will burn down yeah, or yeah. something something will happen the services disappear and people get upset so we try to take any services which are kind of half official and we would rather move them into onto debian org hardware and we so if you have a service which is 
kind of a half official thing and you want to make it more official and actually have somebody do the do the base OS maintenance for you so you don't have to worry about that, then please come and talk to us. We're quite happy to provide you with reasonable VMs. Yeah. Yeah, how to contact us? There is, uh, uh, the, well, there are deb uh, several mailing lists. There is a Debian admin at debian.org mailing list where we discussed, I think, last year that this uh, mailing list will more or less be opened uh, to every Debian developer. So Debian developers then can subscribe to that mailing list as well. Um, there's a DSA, dot, uh, DSA at debian.org email address, um, which we changed to the, um, due to the fact that um, there was a Debian admin at debian.org email address and there was quite a lot of confusion about the Debian admin at lists and the Debian admin at debian.org email address, so we decided to move to a new email alias, which is dsa at debian.org. Yeah. We hang yeah. around on, on IRC, as mentioned earlier, um, in the pound Debian admin IRC channel, so feel free to join there. If you have any issues, just raise them and talk to us. Yeah, uh, we, I, I mean, like any any people and any teams in Debian, we obviously have more things to do than we actually have time for. So help is very much appreciated. Uh, there is getting help with sysadmin tasks. Is, it's kind of an interesting challenge because you can't just give out root to all Debian org machines to somebody who shows up and goes, I would like to rewrite your authentication infrastructure. Uh, but however, uh, since we keep the, the puppet repository and so on in Git, there's, it's at least possible for people to get, uh, get in and contribute, send us patches, uh, show up, discuss things. If, if you think that something can be improved, it, that's quite likely, and we would be happy to, to discuss how to do that. Um, documentation is always welcome. Uh, there is a bit of documentation for things like uh, DB, Debian, org, and so on but more is always w welcome. Um, also, ha just hanging out on IRC, uh, answering people's question is often we really surprisingly useful. Yeah, we also really want to like to grow the team from the seven persons team we are currently. Um, we had, I think, recently uh, or a few months ago spoken to a Debian developer who, is he here in the room? Um, might be. Um, who uh, well said he will he currently does not want to become member of the DSA team due to the fact that he has too much other things other duties in Debian, so just talk to us and help us and then at one point we probably try uh, or probably get annoyed with too, uh, give, uh, doing too much tasks for you so we just give uh, give out root access and. It's how it usually works in Devon, right? At some point, you, you have contributed enough that it's annoying to mo it's more annoying to merge your patches and review them than to just give you access. So that happens. Well, I think that's all about the slides. And well, just ask questions. I guess this is more DSA, but uh, the the list master pieces are those in Puppet as well. No, I, uh, list stuff is not in Puppet. What the, the XM config we are using on Debian.org machines is in Puppet, um, but lists uses um, Postfix. Um, I don't know if you, uh, Alex Wirt is also sitting here in the in the lecture room who could easily answer you questions for listsdebian.org as well. <coughs> more questions? No more questions? <laughs> so, as... Oh. 
you, lad. So, as one of the local admins for uh, a bunch of buildies, um, I know that every now and again we keep um, we get asked for more stuff opening up, more ports, because we're one of those evil places with a firewall, um, even for the DMZ. Um, do you actually have a central list of all of the things that you that you want to be able to to get access to? You know that kind of thing would be awesome that I could just point, say, the you know the ARM um, network sysadmins sys at, instead of every now and again having to say, oh, and we need this extra thing, and then backwards and forwards, because their immediate response is, well, why? You know, if we can give them a list um, mm. and just say, you know, give them a notification to say that, you know, there's a few new things we'd like, um, it might go easier. Uh, I don't think, like, I, I don't think we have a list as such. What is we have a uh, our our firewall config is default deny. So we have a list of things we want to be able to to accept on various shows. So even though we don't have a list as in go to this web page and here you have these ports and their justification, we can we can generate that. Uh, so yeah, that's a good idea. We should we should do something like that. Could you uh, explain more about your uh, backups system? I think you covered it very briefly. Uh, yeah, so we have, do you know Bacla? So Bacla is a, uh, it's a centralized backup system using, uh, it's kind of a mesh, mix of push and pull in that you have a central director which tells the machines that are to be backed up that you are now going to be backing your things up to this storage daemon over here. And then you t also t it also tells the storage daemon that please expect a connection from, from this machine. Uh, we run, so we run the director, which is this central component that runs in AVM in, uh, in Bytemark. Uh, the actual storage uh, is at DGI. And obviously the various backup by machines being a bar everywhere. Um, one of the painful things about Bacla is that it thinks that even though we were backing up to hard drives, it still thinks we're actually backing up to tape drives. And that makes for, the nice thing about, uh, about hard drives is that generally you don't really have seek time in the same way you have seek time on, on tapes, right? Uh, so you don't care about uh, Revising tapes and switching to a different tape and so on. That's called opening another file and that's kind of, it doesn't take very long. Uh, we also have the problem that Bacala will, it will, it, it doesn't have a concept. So if you look at a backup system like a backup PC, it, it never does full backups. It will only do incremental backups and then has a hard lake form. Uh, Bacala will do a full backup, then incrementals, then a full backup, then incrementals. This makes less sense when you have hard drives than when you have tapes. Uh, and also the scheduler isn't very smart in that if it can't back up a machine for some reason, then instead of rescheduling that, that backup, it will, depending on how you configure it, it will then just skip it. Um, some of our hosts aren't actually don't have that well good connections. So when you're then trying to do a full backup, which can take 24 hours, you really don't want that TCP stream to be disconnected because then you lost that full backup. Um, and and also it it end up ends up batching the the full backup. So we have they're very clustered rather than being nicely spread out. So what w one of the things we're looking at. To uh, uh, writing a different scheduler for Bacla just to basically tell it please do a full backup of this host now rather than relying on the on the built-in back uh, scheduler so I'm the maintainer of a package called BUP um, it's, uh, it's not a full fledged backup system with you know scheduler etc um, but it does it does use uh, for its back end uh, Git pack files rather than uh, tapes. So if you're interested mm. in Git, that may be 
uh, some interesting technology to take a look at. Last time I looked at BOP, it didn't actually support uh, expiring backups, which makes for some pain. Right, you can, there are some workarounds, but yeah, you, there, that's one of the uh, limitations currently. Yeah, and, and for us, uh, that would mean we would run into, like, I'm sure Seagate or, or uh, Western Digital would be very happy, but I'm not sure that our, our treasurer would be as happy. So we kind of need, we need the, the ability to expire backups just because we don't have infinite size hard drives and backups are actually quite big. Well, one of the well, one of the other issues um, with Bacula is that currently all of the full backups run at the same time, so we run into some sort of bandwidth limitations, which is also not it's not an issue, but it's it's annoying that all machines are doing the full backups at the same time. Any else questions? So you meant touched on earlier as well, single sign-on. Um, what services are next for that? Um. Don't run away from the mic. <laughs> Do you want to come to the front? Then? Yeah, the Um, also, uh, I'll answer that and as far as I know, and then, but then pe many people may have different plans. Uh, single Sanyon is currently using DAX, which uh, I would suggest against in general. <laughs> uh, having looked deeply into it, uh, it, um, it was probably it, se it probably seemed like, the, like seemed like a good idea at the time, but internet moved in a different direction. Um, so, um, but DAX is still useful because it, it's an Apache thing. So um, one can just put a, a directory of static files under DAX. Um, and that can be done reasonab quite reasonably simply. And uh, um, at DEPCONF, I want to discuss with uh, the uh, currently available uh, DSAs about uh, finishing the DAX setup, putting the, the basic stuff in Puppet, and making a guide for deploying new stuff. Any developer that, that deploys Debian services can set up DAX um, reasonably easily. Uh, but the way that I see we should go in the future is OAuth 2, which is what we are using for the conference thing. Um, because, well, that's a bit more like um, a standard that may work now, and uh, uh, which hopefully supports logout, <laughs> which <laughs> DAX does not do very well. Um, uh, just a moment. Uh, I, I Unfortunately, I have not studied OAuth 2, so I'm not interested, uh, well, I'm not, uh, it, it won't be me that, that does it. Uh, if any of you knows OAuth 2 and wants to sit down with me and explain it to me step by step during DebConf, then please, uh, I would like to migrate NM and uh, Debian contributors to OAuth 2, if at all possible. Uh, but I do want to understand the protocol before I touch it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so the direction, in, as far as I'm concerned, will be all to we may get stuck with DAX because uh, it integrates with Apache, but I'm not comfortable with it. Uh, and there's too many hacky things to, to make things work as expected. Um, so I wish, uh, at some, my personal dream would be to, to at some point move to OAuth 2 and then replace DAX with, with a, just an OAuth 2 provider. Yeah, one of the other limitations of our current DAX setup is that it only works for the Debian.org domain. Otherwise, we would need to give out uh, credentials to the, um, well, there is some jurisdiction key and um, 
federation keys, so we would need to give out access to them to the Debian.net services. That's one of the other limitations to the current duck setup. So probably OAuth 2 might be the way to go. Um, but in the end, it's up to you and to the Debian developers helping to um, extend the single sign-on. So as, uh, as, as new DAX services, Booksy set up something? Sorry? Uh, Booksy yeah, uh, set up something that uses DAX, but I don't know what it is. Uh, it's a new um, PTS implementation, but it's uh, just for... Uh, um, uh, I think you just want to know if a person is locked in, then he can modify some uh, news on the PTI on the new PTS implementation and so on. Yeah, one one good thing with DAX at the moment is that login is optional, and and it totally supports serving a, a, a site as it is. And if one is logged in in single sign-on, then more stuff can happen on top. Uh, but. Yeah, we, I think OAuth 2 is the bet, uh, better thing for the wiki to do. Does Moin uh, do OAuth 2? I think I looked that up a few months ago and I think it supports OAuth 2. DAX will give you a remote user variable. So in theory it's easy, but uh, if it does OAuth 2, then uh, it's more future-proof, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, OK. <laughs> so, of course, the fun thing with the wiki as well, I mean, I'm going to touch about on this, we've got a wiki and web buff, see, advertising too. Um, we've also currently got, like, thousands of existing user accounts um, now, obviously, for people who've already got Alioth or a Debian LDAP accounts, then we, we will encourage people to merge and just move over to those. But for the many thousands of others who haven't, we're going to have to come up with something. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't have an answer for that on the spot. Uh, they're kind of. It's tempting to say, well, they can just get themselves an Aleph account. Um, it might be kind of, some people might be upset at that answer. Uh, there, I, I guess there is also a question about how many of these accounts are actually active, rather than somebody registered back in 2005 and haven't used the account since. Um, I'd be happy to have a conversation about this during DevConf because for Debian contributors, I require to have an Alioth account to get credited in site uh, because I don't want to have a user database in Debian contributors. It may be too much of a strict requirement. It may be that we just document that if you do anything in Debian, you get an Alioth account. Mm. Let's talk about it in separately. Yeah, in that case, I think we need to have a conversation with my other hat, which is um, the hat of various other people with it, which is the admin account, uh, sorry, ad admin hat. Uh, yeah, as the person who inflicted Alioth logins on everybody for DebConf this year, I've, I have been getting feedback that the, um, in particular, the sign up process for Alioth is a bit, um, in, a bit of an obstacle. Um, so there's a few things there which I think we should talk about streamlining. I, as, as the person who, who decided that we were for this year moving away from Penta and, and moving to Summit, I strongly felt no, I did not want to have uh, an authentication database. I didn't want password hashes in, in Summit. And so I, I said, yes, we're going to have to figure out how to hook this up to Debian SSO. And the consequence of that was, yes, we had the Debian SSO, which is only available for Debian developers. Alioth was the other day the database that was out there. Um, and so I guess uh, my fault, I apologize for anybody who was stressed about the, the rollout of that because I didn't entirely coordinate with all the parties uh, ahead of time. But uh, I think it's hanging together fairly well. Um, but we should talk sometime this week about where we should go forward with that and if Alioth is the right um, authentication provider. But I think it's important that we, we agree that there be an authentication provider for these kinds of services, whether that lives in Alioth or somewhere else. Yeah, I have a flat namespace. A flat user with, namespace. With a flat user namespace, yes, which we kind of have today. We have now because Alioth has dash guests. 
Well, actually, so the way the the way OAuth provides them is you get a domain name with it. So, um, in fact, all Debian developers have two different. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a flat namespace, and, and Debian developers all have two they can use. <laughs> More questions? Or yeah, you mentioned that uh, all our hosting is sponsored by the hosts and we get some hardware donations at least. I think we buy some as well, don't we? Yeah. But, so but my question isn't really about that. It's more about how much uh, support do we get? Well, there, there's 1.5, well, two ten, tending to one hardware manufacturers on the sponsors there. How much support do we get from them for doing interesting stuff? You know, I'm thinking like, for instance, you mentioned uh, we get fairly regular controller failures on some of our hardware and all the sponsors we've got have got nice but hard to set up uh, multipath things uh, and it seems to me it would be interesting for us and for them to set things up like that on the Debian infrastructure. Is that kind of thing possible? Or? Yeah, so uh, we do have that in, in some places like uh, the bike mark setup, uh, the UBC ECE setup and so on. That's a there we have a SAN, we have a, a bunch of machines, and either it's doing SATA or it's doing Fabric Channel. Uh, so sorry? ISCASI. ISCASI as well, yeah. Uh, so we, we do have a, a bunch of that. The problem is if you want to do data storage where you have available 25 terabytes and you want to do that on a SAN, that's very not cheap. That's really quite expensive. Uh, so that's the reason why those machines with special special storage requirements, in some like backups and snapshot, basically, they're different, um, and that's also why they these two machines because they have they have like five controllers each. Uh, so that's why they're they're different in in, in that regard. Uh, we do get a we do get a, a bunch of sponsorship from hot the hardware vendors. Uh, we usually buy HP gear, uh, partially because we have good experience with it. Um, it generally we had works. Good connections into HP. Yeah, we also <laughs> have yeah historically good connections. They've been good at, uh, about giving us hardware in the past. They're happy to sponsor Debian and DevConf, both both in actual terms of money given to us, but also in in terms of giving us pretty nice prices. Um, we haven't, I don't think we've actually approached them about saying, could you please give us this enormously expensive piece of hardware? Um, it's often hard for them to give that away because it has to come out of somebody's budget and somehow they don't have large sands just hidden under the, their <laughs> desks. So, um. More questions, criticism? Hi, I was just curious about your mail infrastructure. Um, it doesn't look like <coughs> you use DKIM or SPF or DMARC records. Um, do you have plans for any of that? Uh, there's been some experimentation with the uh, domain keys. Uh, so Luca has been playing with that. Um, there's this interesting project some people, we generally don't provide outgoing SMTP for random people um, because that's we painful. We are not a mail provider, we are. Yeah, uh, obviously you get a De uh, Debian org account, so you get incoming email, uh, which we then forward on to somewhere where it hopefully you'll actually remember to update, update that when that account expires rather than giving us bounces. Um, that's that's a, a big change which we forgot to mention. Uh, is that we actually are in the process of reworking the entire ma way, way we do mail. Uh, we have drastically reduced the number of incoming mail servers. So most mail now goes to a set of two uh, MXs. Yeah, it will increase in future. Sorry? It will increase in future and at MIT we will open up a one more mail server. Well, we can. Um, currently we have two. Uh, 
and then if there is special mail routing needed, then it will be routed to the right, the right internal host. But most hosts no longer listens for incoming mail from the internet, which is a good thing. Uh, not only because it means um. we don't have to run spam assassin everywhere. We um, can only Peter, run the machine. Peter did this uh, Dane D A N E um, yeah, so SMTP. Yeah, uh, Weasel Peter wanted to do uh, or want to do Dane opportunistic encryption for outgoing uh, outgoing mails. Uh, so we're we're experimenting with a bunch of things. Uh, for the what I was going to say about domain keys is that because we don't provide that going mail service, it means that you need to be able to provide to the infrastructure what your what your key is going to be. And Luca has been working on some patches to UDL Lab to do this, so it can show up in the in DNS and so on. So yes, things are happening. Um, if like if you're interested in that, absolutely do grab us, and we can talk more about it. Okay, I think we are done because the time is al almost over. I have one more small announcements announcement to make. Um, um, the Luca offered some ripe NCC Atlas nodes um, to give away, and um, the persons who um, applied for those nodes and uh, got in the list of getting those nodes, please come to me or talk to me directly after the talk so I can give out, hand out those nodes because Luca is not here at the uh, DEPCON 14 this year. Animal. Is there any plans to use YubiKeys? Uh, I, I'm the maintain or I'm part of the maintainer keys uh, maintainer team of the YubiKey tools in in Debian. I would very much like to use them for some things. Uh, there is a bunch of. We need to find out how they should best fit into the infrastructure if we're going to do that. Uh, one thing which has been mentioned is for some cases we want to do actual two-factor. Uh, currently, there is there is no two-factor authentication anywhere. Um, so, help help us in uh, setting up those infrastructure. Then we might. So yes, uh, there are no concrete plans, but yes, we're very much aware of of YubiKeys, and uh, I'm kind of looking for for good places to to put them in because I like I I like them. I like both the company and the product, and they're also they also quite happy to sponsor. Free software stuff. So, yeah. Done. I think we are done. Yeah. With I think we're wise. out of time. So, yeah. Thank you for being here. If you have any more questions, grab us afterwards. <laughs>